place to be. Where um, we've got Paul Smith joining us, I think. Well, obviously, you know that. I think that's responsible for the significant numbers this evening. Uh, but before I introduce Paul, I just remind you of a few things that are coming up. Um, the 27th of January, the Snowdrop Gala in Ballon. Hester, you're there somewhere. Um, are there any tickets left? You can unmute and let us know if there are any tickets left for Ballon. I know it was nearly booked up the other day. Um, there may be a few left. A few spaces left. A few. Okay, so there are a few left for Ballon. Thanks very much, Hester. Yeah, just... Yeah, the last few chalk ices. Last few chalk ices. So that's there. Always a great day. Um, talks in the morning and then um, Altamont in the afternoon. That's the 27th, which is Saturday week. And then Hester's own garden is open for members on the 3rd. And uh, I'm delighted to say that is also almost booked out. So you want to be fast off the blocks this evening or to press this evening to book that or tomorrow morning, if not. So that's Cushin and Cork. Uh, and that is on the 30, the 3rd of February. Uh, our next Zoom is the 31st of January. Sorry, I'm chopping backwards and forwards a bit on the calendar. And that's Brona Dorr. And uh, her topic is the one that we've been perhaps a bit representing a bit less. And that is vegetables. So her, her talk is growing to eat for one or two. And her plan is to produce vegetables for the table every day of the year or some vegetable for the table every day of the year which is a, quite an achievement and then 8th to the 11th of february belfield open for snowdrops that's one weekend this year but it's four days thursday friday saturday sunday uh, 11 a.m to 4 p.m um there'll be tours of the garden with paul at 12 and 2 there'll be talks on books by george cunningham who is a, a local man from ross gray who is uh, getting our RHS library in order down there, and he's going to show people some interesting gardening books. And um, he he and there'll be tea and coffee and cake and lots of chat. So if we see bundles of you down there, that'll be a great way to physically meet up and chat. So that's Belfield, the eighth to the eleventh of February, and then on the following weekend from the eleventh, so that's the eighteenth, I think it is. Um, there's another day in Fancroft Mill, Angela Jupe's former home nearby and uh, there's a day there to raise money for the Belfield Library and that is going to involve a talk by John Feen, Feeney and um, George Cunningham on books and a tour of the mill and a tour of Angela's garden now Marcus and Irene Sweeney's garden so that's the second a second day in the middle so there's loads happening loads happening um, enough of that I think many of you know Paul um, many of you have met Paul and uh, we're very pleased that Paul is with us in Belfield as our head gardener. We couldn't think of better, in fact. Um, we, and uh, loads of work going on down there. There must have been about nine volunteers there today. There was a huge amount of work going on. Great to see buzz of activity around the place. Paul is a Carlo native, for those of you who don't know his background, a Carlo native, and then went to Kildalton and graduated there and uh, found his way nearly to Burke Castle, but by a narrow miss of a phone call, uh, ended up in Belfield with Angela Jupe, uh, which really was the beginning of his association with Belfield in about 2010, and uh, is is back in Belfield now since last year uh, as head gardener, but had always retained a contact and a friendship with Angela in the intervening years and had worked there periodically. He then disappeared off to deepest, darkest Wales at one point, worked in Krug Farm for some years as a propagator and did a bit of work in London. And then, as you can see from behind me, I think a fairly familiar photograph uh, came back to Ireland during COVID. And we had gardening together going on with Dermot, Gavin, our patron and Paul every evening at seven o'clock. Uh, just think of the funny hats, really. Um, and the dogs. Uh, and that was a hugely generous spirited uh, program for people when we were all in lockdown. That must have been the first lockdown. Yeah, it was. And it, it that went for ages. And behind me is is the book uh, of Gardening Together. So um, that copies will be available in Belfield. Uh, they can be signed by the author for a small fee of uh, uh, and a bit of chat. Um, so that's available, too. So, Paul, as you know, has um, a passion for snowdrops. If you don't know, he does have a passion for snowdrops. They're his special area of interest, but that does not exclude a tremendously knowledgeable plants man from having huge interest in a wide range of plants all over the place. Uh, 
He's a, a super, super tour guide and a super guardian in Belfield. And we're delighted to have you with us, Paul, to talk this evening. So I'm going to shut up and hand over to you and mute myself. So you unmute and press the share button whenever you're ready. Sorry, that's better. Um, I found it. Uh, thank you, Philip, and thank you all for joining in tonight. Um, I didn't realize that I told Philip that it was a missed phone call, how I uh, ended up in Belfield, uh, but <laughs> I obviously did. Um, but uh, yeah, it was one of those uh, strange twists of fate, I guess. But that's how, uh, well, it's not how I ended up here, but it is uh, in a way how I ended up here um, and uh, got in touch with Angela. And that was in, I think, autumn of 2012. So 12 years ago, I first uh, met her and I have known her ever since uh, until her death uh, in 2021 and uh, Angela just out of uh, curiosity it is 20 years this year since she bought Belfield uh, as Philip mentioned there there is an event on in her old garden in Fancroft uh, to raise money for our library uh, kind of fund here but her old garden Fancroft she sold that in 2006 but she bought here in late 2004 so Belfield as a garden in Angela's time is only in its 20th year and in those 20 years has changed um, quite dramatically and uh, will continue to change as uh, we uh, here in the RHSI um, with myself and Philip and Orla and all the other key people uh, involved down here in Belfield um, uh, steer it into its kind of its new light. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to share the screen and hopefully it's all going to be okay. Uh, why isn't it letting me share? Oop, that's not what I wanted. No, it's coming. It's coming. Is it being a bit slow? A uh, tiny bit of a delay, but it's grand. If you just hit slideshow now, you're grand. Grand. Uh, from the beginning. Right. There we are. Brilliant. Um, and just uh, to give people who may not know about uh, Belfield, as Philip mentioned, I ended up here uh, working 10 years ago. Sorry, I thought I just flicked off my laptop charger with my foot under the table, which isn't a good idea. Uh, this is the peril of doing a Zoom talk. If I was standing up, I wouldn't have kicked it. Um, but uh, this is Belfield. So Belfield uh, situated right in the middle of Ireland, for anyone who doesn't know it. Um, its last owner, Angela Jupe, uh, was a garden architect, was a garden designer, uh, was a plants woman, was many, many different things for those of you who knew her. Um, and there are quite a few of you online tonight who knew and um, worked with Angela even. So uh, this is Belfield. And as you can see uh, from this photograph, Belfield's thing is snowdrops. Um, and as a result of working down there, it has became, as Philip sort of alluded to at the beginning, one of my things. And uh, this is Belfield pretty much at its peak um, early on in the year at the front of the house. And at the front of the house, apart from a little bit to the left of what was the monkey puzzle tree had just since actually came down. Uh, it's pretty much pure white. And we were working to make basically the entire front of Belfield, it's about two acres of land at the front of the house, an entire carpet of snowdrops. And that's something we'll be doing. And we are have already done even last year. So um, yeah, Belfield is uh, an extraordinary place. Uh, we, the RHSI as an organization, uh, I'm sure of speaking for everyone here, but uh, I think we're all very lucky that uh, it has now taken on the custodianship of the RHSI and it is now remaining as a garden and a garden that will be open to the public. And when Angela left it to the RHSI, she left clear instructions that she wanted it to become a garden of learning um, and a garden of plants and people. And that's one thing that we've done and we were mentioning it there just before we uh, went on. I think just it was in the chat about the students coming down from the Botanic Gardens last week. We had 50 something students here last Wednesday. They were lifting and dividing snowdrops with us. They were dividing perennials in the garden and they were doing kind of exactly what Angela wished that uh, they were coming down into the garden to learn to see the practical end of gardening because uh, whatever about gardening in a uh, I suppose, a classroom environment. Gardening is something, as you all know, that has to be practiced and done in person. And uh, Belfield will very much be a place where you will be doing that in person. So 
Tonight, I'm going to give you a very brief tour about snowdrops. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about them, but also other spring plants, other spring bulbs. It's not just snowdrops that we grow here. It is one of our main attractions, but we do have lots of other spring beauties, um, including daps and sycamore and what have you. And I'm going to mention a few of my favorites, mention a few of my favorite methods, talk a little bit about propagation of them, and just give you a general overview as well of, I suppose, Belfield and the work that we're doing here um, all of the time. So. Uh, that's Belfield, but let me move on to talking a bit more specifically about snowdrops. Um, I'm not going to use too many boring maps like this. Uh, it's not that boring, but most of the slides here are going to be more uh, interesting pictures. But this is just giving you an idea of snowdrops, and it actually applies to most bulbs. It doesn't just apply to snowdrops. Um, this is their kind of geographical distribution around Europe. Uh, the light green color being the common snowdrop that we all grow. Uh, and basically all of the different species as you see there kind of all come around the Black Sea um, in kind of central, well, Eastern to Central Europe. That's where most of our snowdrop species uh, arrive. And actually, to be honest, that's where most of our garden species are from. That's a biodiversity hotspot in terms of the flora that are actually from that part of the world. So that's where a huge amount of the garden plants that we know, love and grow in our gardens in Ireland and the UK and everywhere else all over Europe, they all come from around that part of the world. Turkey is a particularly rich country uh, for bulbs, but lots of other uh, countries over that neck of the woods have a huge diversity of plants and we're lucky that they have been traveled all over Europe. Snowdrops aren't actually native to Ireland as a kind of sideline. Um, and most of these bulbs aren't in fact, there's very few native bulbs um, and snowdrops are not a native, uh, even Galantis navalis, you can see there it's native to northern France, not really native to uh, mainland Britain or Ireland. Uh, they think maybe the Romans or one of those kind of early settlers uh, to the UK and here brought them over. So they've been here a long time, uh, you know, and they've been spread around a long time. Uh, but they are not actually uh, native to here. Uh, and they were brought over for loads of different reasons. They have religious connotations. They are the symbol of hope, symbol of purity, symbol of renewal, because they are pretty much the first thing that flowers. So without getting into too much, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Galanthus or snowdrops have a, a following. And uh, to say that the following, uh, some of the people who collect them, and I count myself as one of these people, so I can say this with... Um, uh, a little bit of uh, not knocking everyone, but this is a bit of an obsession, I suppose. Snowdrops are a plant that people really go mad collecting. But to break it down, I want to kind of explain to you a little bit more about just the more normal snowdrops that you grow on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and also the kind of common snowdrops that you will come across and then explain a little bit how those snowdrops have kind of led the way into all these mad hybrids. Um, and to just give a little bit of context to that, some snowdrops can sell for hundreds of euros for a single bulb. And in occasional cases, snowdrops have sold for thousands of euros for a single bulb of snowdrops. So there is a whole galantomania, as they call it. So the kind of the madness that's involved with collecting snowdrops. Um, and there are a few of us who are a little bit more involved in that than others. And Angela Duke uh, here in Belfield was certainly a galantomania. Um, and I'll tell you about maybe one or two stories about that later. Um, but yeah, she was very much into it. But just to give you a context of all the snowdrops you can find and come across. I'm going to talk about three main ones to start with, maybe four main ones, and then I'm going to talk about a couple others and then explain how all of these crazy hybrids, um, and not crazy hybrids, but more of the normal hybrids that you find have been derived. So this one is Galanthus navalis, the common snowdrop, um, which is the one most commonly found, as I've said before, all over Europe and in our gardens at home. Um, it's got that lovely dainty kind of dangling flower, the outer and inner petals, as we call them, the long outer petals, smaller inner petals, and the inner petal has that horseshoe shape, which is pretty much uh, standard with all common snowdrop. Uh, one way of identifying these is something Broomfield taught me this years ago when she did a lecture here, is not looking necessarily at the flower, which is helpful, but doesn't always give you uh, the true indicator, but looking at how the leaves are formed on uh, the main three species. And Galanthus navalis, um, if you look at it, when uh, Galanthus navalis comes up, it's like a set of praying hands. Um, the two leaves go like this, and then the flower scape goes up through the middle of Galanthus navalis um, in its first instance. And then this is the next one that you'll come across very commonly. Um, and when people find this, the first time I found this in garden somewhere, I brought it back to Angela when I was working here, told her, I found the new snowdrop, it's amazing. Um, but this is probably the second most common snowdrop that you'll find grown in gardens and even in wild places. And it tends to do better than the single snowdrop, uh, weirdly. It's got what we call hybrid vigor. It's got a little bit of, um, uh, you know, its parents, um, uh, 
basically has a stronger gene than its parents. Um, and this is Galantis nivalis floroplina, which is basically just a common double snowdrop, a very variable thing. That's probably a nice picture on the left of it. Um, and on the right, that's probably a nicer bunch, but they can vary massively and some are more ugly and more tainted, but they are a, an interesting thing. And one thing about these, and I'll talk about it in a minute, they tend to produce pollen, but not seed, which is an important thing when it comes to the breeders of these snowdrops, which I will chat about in a minute. One of the other common snowdrops that you will come across uh, quite frequently in gardens and particularly in um, older gardens is one that's here called Placatus, so Galanthus Placatus. Um, this one is grown very commonly here in Belfield, we have it all over the place, um, but it does have an interesting sort of storyline to it. Um, a lot of the Galanthus Placatus here came from a garden outside Temple Moor, and that garden um, is called Dramard, and it has a connection uh, with one of the family members uh, going to uh, the war in, oh, not the Boer War. I can't think of the name of it now. Uh, of course, it escapes me. But um, the war, uh, one of the 18th century, around the time of the Irish famine, 1845 wars um, down that part of the world. And uh, the returning soldier brought back bulbs of this. And uh, it's very common that there was uh, soldiers from lots of these families with these big houses, and they brought back different plants. It was quite common um, at the time. And Glantis Placatus was one of them that came back. Um, very Crimean War, that's the word I couldn't think of. The Crimean War was where um, a lot of these came back from because they are very native to that part of the world. Um, and the Placatus is one that you see a lot of. And the Placatus, much taller snowdrop on its leaf, uh, very nicely pleated. So that was something that taught me that one, that if you look at placatus, think of pleat and pleat. Uh, the leaf is pleated. The flower is variable, varies a lot. That's a, I wouldn't call it standard, but it does vary um, in its flower size and shape and everything, but it always tends to have at least a bit of pleating in the leaf. Uh, Galanthus elwesii then is the, the, again, the third or the fourth, if you want to say that, most common of the snowdrops. Um, Elwesii, again, from all that part of the world around the Black Sea, uh, the difference with Elysii, again, the flower tends to be a little bit more marked and a bit more, um, its inner marking tends to be a bit more refined and you can see it has a fatter flower. It is generally taller, um, but one of the main features of it is it leave, or its leaves, again, it has wider leaves, much wider than the other species, much more glaucousy, so that bluey grey colour. And if you look at the leaf formation of them, it's again, look at the leaf, not at the flower. The leaves, uh, unlike the Paca or the Nivalis, which is grey like that, they actually like hug the uh, stem of the flower spike coming up. So they wrap around it rather than go like uh, flat on it, like the Glantus nivalis. So they're a couple of the most common ones. And what's happened with these, and I'm gonna just point out a few others as well, uh, because these are ones you come across a lot. I love this one. Again, it's hard to identify looking at the flower, but if anyone looks at the leaf of that, um, it's a very easy snowdrop to identify, or at least it's a very easy snowdrop to identify. It has a little bit of it in it. So you see the leaf there is very, very obviously twisted. This is actually a photograph taken in Ultimate Gardens. Uh, that's one of their clumps on the main walk in Carlo. And that's a great clump of Galantis gracilis, um, which is another species quite commonly grown, um, not as common as the others, but you do see it and you certainly see it in parentage of other plants. It has a lovely limey green coloring as well on the ovary. And this is a bit of an oddity. Um, this is Galanthus regina algae. The photograph on the right, I think I actually took this when Angela was alive. It was probably one of my last visits to Belfield, um, probably the autumn before she died. But this is Galanthus uh, regina algae growing in the garden here in Belfield. Um, early flowering, so it flowers in October time into November. Um, very, very odd, I guess, because you can see there's a bit of autumn colour in the background of that photograph there of the folly in the background, which is our main feature in the centre of the wall garden. Um, it's a difficult plant to grow. We have a heavy, wet soil here in Offaly, and to be perfectly honest, I haven't been able to relocate that flower since. So it has actually probably died out in that spot, which is unfortunate, and it's happened a bit here with a few of the things, but um, it's a harder one to grow. The first three are quite easy. Uh, Regina alga is a little bit harder to grow. And I wanted to mention all them, and I've just put this photo up to explain uh, a little bit about how all of these then have led the way to uh, all these crazy mad hybrids and different things that you see. Um, and this is just a snowdrop in my own parents' garden, actually, not my garden, my parents' garden in Carlo, which uh, I put in a bit of lawn, as you see there. And after flowering, uh, that is a lovely example of all of the seed pods of the snowdrop really fattening up. That was probably April time. The flowers are long gone. The bees and the different critters that are out doing early pollination, of which they do do that, believe it or not. 
Um, they were out there and they've pollinated the plant and they've cross-pollinated it. And that's what's happened. It's cross-pollinated. And because I grow a load of different types of species in the garden there, and you know, in Belfield, we grow lots of species, cross-pollination has happened. So the double pollen off of the Galantis nivalis floroplina may have crossed with Galantis gracilis to give you a, a different hybrid. And over the years, most of these hybrids that we have been growing have actually just been natural crosses that have happened out of kind of pure fluke. Uh, but there are now breeders uh, in different parts of the world who are going and actually breeding snowdrops, um, a notable couple of them, in fact, uh, and it's more and more common. But for a long time, bulbs and snowdrops uh, were just plants that were uh, basically found as fluke, and then people would go and propagate them and sell them. Uh, and this is just to give you an example. So without me rabbiting on too much about snowdrops, which I promise I won't, I am going to mention other plants, but these are all the variations that you can get in uh, just a couple of flowers of snowdrops. And uh, there's a few very common ones there to the kind of right middle, uh, one called Diggory, which has got a very uh, ruffled bell shape to it. Um, to the left, I think Lady Elfenstein, uh, some of the yellows there, which are very obvious in their, um, you know, the yellowness, which is just a lack of chlorophyll, but that makes them a very distinct hybrid and some have fuller markings, some have doubling, some have all sorts of different markings. But basically, um, there are all of the variations that you come across. And uh, I suppose for those of you who don't think much of snowdrops, apart from that they're pretty and they're early, this seems a little bit bonkers, but um, people do go mad for them and they are the first thing up in the garden. If I go out into the garden today, uh, the frost was so hard this morning. We were saying there last night we had minus two, the night before we had minus six. Every single plant in the garden was whacked, all the snowdrops even, they were flat on the ground. But after a few hours of defrost or thawing, defrosting, they're back up. They have basically an antifreeze in them, a natural antifreeze. So they can take this hard weather, unlike most other plants, which if you put it out in the first sign of frost, they'll have fallen over. And here is just an example of showing you all the different markings that you can get. Uh, so the marking inside the middle, uh, that inner petal is quite important. And this is just all those different ones that you come across um, in their various uh, guises and forms. And I'll show you one or two of them later on. But the marking in the middle makes a big difference. And I know that's a very small difference to most people, but it does, if you see them clumped together, when you see collections like we have here in Belfield, you begin to appreciate uh, all of the differences and why people would collect them. But I just want to talk about a few kind of good ones that are mostly ones that I would recommend people growing. And here's, I suppose, three of the best or three of the most commonly available in terms of ones that are a little bit different, but also are uh, great garden plants. Uh, the top there, Magnet, uh, with its very wide open petals, um, like a helicopter, uh, lovely. Uh, Brenda Troil and S. Arnott there at the bottom, uh, very similar snowdrops. S. Arnott probably being, I mean, slightly better in that it's very, very tall very, very vigorous. Um, it's a great plant and it has a very slight scent of honey too. Uh, most snowdrops have a slight scent, but we just don't really appreciate it because number one, you're not down on your hands and knees. Um, and number two, you know, it's very, very cold. So it's often hard to smell in the cold. But if you bring in a few snowdrops, put them in a vase in your kitchen, you will often get a lovely little bit of scent off them, particularly this variety S. Arnott. So there are three of the first ones. This is one that when I first came to Belfield, I went, oh, maybe all snowdrops aren't just green and, you know, the same, that they do vary a lot. And this one grabbed my attention. The photo here is actually taken in Belfield in an area. Again, uh, this has happened a little bit here. Uh, that photo was taken probably 10 years ago. That now doesn't exist anymore, that clump. Um, so this is Galantis South Hayes. Um, and South Hayes to this day still commands quite a high price from uh, snowdrop collectors. Uh, and for that reason that, you know, we had a clump here that was doing quite well. And then over the years, it has just petered out. Some of these snowdrops are not the easiest to grow. The first three I showed you are very easy to grow. This one is probably a little bit more finicky. I'm sure some people will argue that, you know, it goes well for me, but uh, I have found that it doesn't always um, jump back up. But South Hayes, you can see total opposite. The outer petals are reflexed in the opposite direction. The inner petal, it has markings on it. It's got all sorts of things you don't expect of a snowdrop. And therefore it makes it look very distinctive when it's in a clump in the garden. Uh, and some of them, the names can often be amusing and the names can be very, uh, you know, make sense. Here's one called um, Galanthus Daphne Scissors. Uh, and if you have a close look in the middle there, you begin to see, oh, that's why it's called Daphne Scissors, because the marking is a lovely scissor shape and it's got a little green tinge on the outside of the petal. But the main reason that one has been called such is because uh, it has lovely scissors. And people will, you know, these have all probably just been fluke founds that people have got in the garden and they named them after friends and family and relatives. And I'll speak a little bit about that in a minute. This is one of my favorites. And I think it's a favorite because it's a great snowdrop. It's relatively easy to come by. 
Uh, I found it does very well for me, both in Carlow and I've grown it here in Belfield now, or I'm looking after it here in Belfield. Um, and it's very, very easy snowdrop. Uh, Mrs. McNamara, and that photograph was taken Christmas Day about two years ago. Christmas Day this year, that snowdrop was in full bloom, fully open. It was a slightly brighter Christmas Day. And also, this is a weird season. We seem to be, with snowdrops anyhow, for, much further ahead with some things this year compared to other things. So it's a very odd season. Some plants are really, really far ahead. Some plants are lagging behind a little bit. Um, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. We've had, you know, we've had a bit of cold. We've had a lot of wet. There's no denying that. Anyone who is um, conscious over Christmas will know that it rained consistently over most of our Christmas. So we've had a an odd kind of um, winter, I suppose. But uh, the snowdrops are responding in a slightly odd way. Uh, but Mrs. McNamara this year was well up out of the ground. But it flowers at Christmas, which I always love. And I think it's a great thing to kind of herald in the new year, something that's flowering straight away. This is a very easily found snowdrop if you are new to the whole collecting of them. Um, if you are taken by any of this, this is one called Vera de Peace. And you can see it has very, very strong outer um, green markings on its petals and it's another strong snowdrop that does quite well um, and it's just one of those ones that uh, it's an easy enough one to grow. I'm all for showing people if you are going to grow snowdrops at least at the beginning grow ones that are easy uh, because if you try to grow those expensive ones that tend to fail uh, you'll soon lose heart and you'll wonder what it's all about but if you do want to try a few different ones these are a couple of quite good ones. Here's another variety you can see here very different to the others I spoke about the leaf here is nearly as distinct as the flower. This is one called Marjorie Brown, photographs obviously in Belfield with the folly in the background. Um, and that is a clump uh, that has been there for as long as I remember. So it's been there for 12 years and it has done well. I've actually looked at it this year and it's beginning to lose a little bit of vigor. So I'll speak about that later on in the slide about when plants seem to do that and when bulbs do that particularly. But I have it in Carlo and in Carlo, it loves the soil there, slightly different soil. Uh, slightly drier soil, but it has huge bulbs when it grows in Carlo, really vigorous, um, and it does very, very well. And it's actually so vigorous that it's pushing up bulbs at the moment, um, which is um, interesting, but I've uh, got a few and potted them up. Uh, really, really wide leaf. It's an Elwesii type, the one that the blue glaucous leaf, and I said it hugs around. Um, and it's flower. Flower isn't as big or as magnificent, but it's just a really strong growing plant that stands out from the others. If you have that around a clump of other snowdrops, instantly you will know that it's different, which is uh, something very nice. And these are others that are very instantly different. Uh, the two probably most commonly grown of the yellows uh, on the left, Wendy's Gold, and probably the most common yellow snowdrop on the right, Spindlestone Surprise. Uh, again, as I said earlier, the yellows are just plants, uh, well, snowdrops that are lacking a little bit of chlorophyll, a little bit of a genetic uh, defunct really. And, it's a bit odd when it comes to plants, you know, um, variegated plants are similar. We don't necessarily, um, you know, actually as uh, I suppose horticulturalists think that variegated plants are very good, but as gardeners and as uh, the ornamental gardeners, we all seem to love variegated plants. But in the wild, in nature, variegation is a bad thing. Uh, often it indicates a little bit of virus, doesn't in these cases, but a vari or variegation basically means less chlorophyll, therefore less photosynthesis and a weaker plant. And it's no exception with these. These tend to be slightly weaker because they are yellow, they lack chlorophyll, they don't do as much photosynthesizing, um, but they still are, these are two very good varieties. Spindles and Surprise, as I say, being slightly better, Wendy's Gold being a placatus with its pleated leaf and its kind of huge inner marking and they are both excellent yellow snowdrops. This is a really good snowdrop um, because it's just a standout one, it, it looks amazing and it's just uh, one of those ones you really like. This is one called Godfrey Owen, um, pure white, it is what they call I think a puculiform which is where it has more outer petals than just a normal three. Um, it's got uh, just a big well, like standout vibrant snowdrop. And if you're growing a couple of plants and you don't have a lot of space, it's one that you grow and like that Marjorie Brown, instantly you kind of go, oh, that looks different. And it will draw your eye if you're going to just grow a couple of snowdrops. Um, named for Margaret Owen, who was an English galanthophile. Um, and actually, I went on a trip this year to a place called, I think it's Acton Piggott on the Welsh English border. Um, with Seamus O'Brien and Margie Phillips. And by pure coincidence and accident, we ended up coming across uh, the grave of both Godfrey Owen and Margaret Owen while looking at this churchyard. Um, Seamus was looking for the Acton family that 
owned Kilmacurra in years gone by, have family connections over there. And he was looking in this particular churchyard and we went with him. We were rambling around and all of a sudden uh, we found the grave of both Godfrey Owen and Margaret Owen, a pure coincidence. And they were uh, English galantophiles, well, Margaret Owen was in particular, and she named this variety for her husband. And this is just one of my favorites again, because I have found it to just do so well. Uh, I've had it in Carlo. I bought it. I don't think I bought it. Maybe I was given it by Robert Miller when I first kind of started gardening and, uh, did, you know, growing snowdrops. He gave me a couple of bulbs, maybe two or three bulbs of this Galantis John Long. And it has grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. And it's not stopped from the day I put it in. Uh, whatever he gave me a great clone because we've got it here and it's not as strong but it's doing all right but whatever Robert gave me um, I've never seen it do so well and uh, I'll even show you later on the division example I use I use the John Long example because it's such a good plant that I have and it stands out really bright flower loads of flower and beautiful beautiful plant and then you have the oddity so uh, not all snowdrops are beautiful um, and this is an example of that and uh, you might grow this for its beauty, you grow it for its oddity. This is one, it's a double, but it's kind of a double that's neither here nor there. As you can see, it doesn't have an ovary, so therefore it will have no ability to produce seed, probably not even pollen. Um, but it is uh, definitely something different. Blueberry tart, um, I think Alan Street, the late Alan Street, uh, was the one who found that uh, from Avon Bulbs. Um, and Avon Bulbs are another uh, UK supplier that have lots of these. And moving closer to home, uh, and closer to my own home in County Carlow, couldn't get any closer. This is Drummond's Joint. And Drummond's Joint was found by the late Stacia O'Neill. Um, and she lived in Ballon in County Carlow, where the Snowdrop Gala is on, that Philip mentioned earlier. Um, and Drummond's was actually a seed company, which was based in Carlow Town. My own granddad actually even worked in Drummond's uh, going back uh, many, many years ago. And in the 40s and 50s, it was a very, very uh, successful and big seed company that grew lots of uh, agricultural seed, but also garden plants. And they had a catalogue and Stacia bought these plants off the catalogue years and years ago and grew it on. I think she bought just a common snowdrop, but was given this, which is a very obviously a Galantis alwesii with its wide glaucous leaf. Um, and it's really full inner marking, not a very tall, it's called Drummond's Joint, but it's, it's a bit um, deceptive. It's not a joint, but it's still a very good, strong growing plant, which does very, very well. And uh, it's nice to have a plant with a connection to home when you're growing it. Um, and another plant with a connection to myself and Angela um, is this one. And this is a lovely plant. And I mentioned earlier, there is a garden in Tipperary, uh, Dramard, where myself and Angela would frequent for many, many years. Um, and it's actually now owned by the Garda Training College. And in Dramard, there was loads of snowdrops and Angela would go there frequently with me and we'd look through them um, as she was doing study for the book that she never wrote about Irish snowdrops. And we were getting photographs and looking around and taking bits of snowdrops here and there. And we were going through this area of them. There's lots of, as I said earlier, the Glanthus placatus, which is that plant which came over via the Crimean War. And we were walking in this clump and I looked down and I saw this one and I thought it's got a very distinct inner mark on it and it looks quite an elegant plant. And I went, ooh, um, that's quite nice. But what I really wasn't expecting was when I turned the plant over and you can see uh, when you turn it over, uh, right in the center, it has this most perfect double, um, doublation or doubling. Uh, the other doubles I showed you are kind of not very perfect or frilly, whereas this is a very neat, perfect double, um, which really made us go, wow. So we uh, went, wow, we can't leave that there. So we dug it up, we brought it back, and I grew it in Carlo, and it's done very well, and it's grown here. Um, and in the last couple of years, we have been spreading it out and giving it to different people. Um, and we've actually named it for my great uncle, who was Hugo Perdue, who was, again, from this part of the world where we are now. Uh, he used to lecture in Gertine College uh, in Tipperary. Um, and this is a snowdrop we named for him. And it's a snowdrop that I love because myself and Angela are both involved in the finding of it. And it's a very good uh, easy enough to grow one. And there is another Irish one called Hill Poe, which some people might go, oh, they're very similar. They're similar, but they have their differences for sure. Um, and I just kind of compared the two here. This is Hill Poe versus Hugo Perdue. Hill Poe tends to have more outer petals. Um, it has at least, I think, four or five, if not more. And it has a slightly different inner, uh, again, more outer. The inner is somewhat similar, but it has more outer petals. I think that's its key. Um, so that's Hill Poe versus uh, the other Galantis Hugo Perdue. And I don't think I maybe we'll mention it in a second, uh, but I just want to then talk about it's all fine. It's all lovely growing these beautiful snowdrops and they're, you know, very 
strange and quirky oddities and all these things. But actually, snowdrops en masse is where it is for most people. And uh, in Belfield, we're lucky we have both. We've got our collections. We've got our, you know, collector's items and our stamp collection, if you want to call it that, of all these lovely named varieties. And we're working on it. And we are doing a little bit at the moment of chopping and changing around to make it uh, work. But the main thing we have here is drifts of snowdrops. And we have what I call the snowdrop lawn. This is the main snowdrop lawn. We've got another snowdrop lawn that we've started to create ourselves in the last year or two. We've got six main lawns in the wall garden in Belfield, which is just under two acres. And each bell or each lawn there, I try to turn into another type of bulb lawn. So this is the snowdrop lawn. We have the tulip lawn. We have the daffodil lawn. We have the primrose lawn, which isn't really a to a bulb but basically uh for anyone who doesn't know i hate cutting grass which is ironic uh, because i am the head gardener here but grass cutting to me uh just uh, really isn't my favorite thing at all um so instead of having lots of grass to cut we have lots of bulb meadows to maintain and we do cut the grass obviously but we just do it in a very different way we manage this garden very differently to how you might expect a wall garden to be managed but it does work and it, here we go again at the front of the house uh, in Belfield, as I said, as far as the eye can see, the plan is that the first, first two acres of Belfield will become white over the next few years. And we're doing that by lifting and dividing, which I'll show you in a while, all these snowdrops here. I also noticed on the way, uh, doing this earlier, uh, actually someone has driven, if you see on the left hand side there, of the snowdrops as you drove in here. Um, and it's a warning to anyone who's, you're coming to Belfield over the next while, if you drive in any of the snowdrops, um, you'll have myself and Angela to <laughs> talk to because because the one thing Angela used to hate was when people drove into Belfield and drove on the snowdrops, um, which happened quite frequently. You wouldn't believe it. Um, but uh, I just had to laugh when I saw that someone had driven on the snowdrops when that photograph was taken. I think a couple of years ago. I'm not quite sure when. Um, and this is just a little bit of an oddity. Uh, Ten years ago, Angela did a snowdrop weekend um in Belfield where she got the great and the good of the snowdrop world over uh, Dr Tom Mitchell came from the UK from uh, his evolution plants nursery uh, some the Broomfield did a talk among loads of other people um and just before we had I worked for Angela at this point and we had the whole garden looking beautiful uh, it was top to bottom pristine we had the paths raked all the weeds were up the snowdrops were looking lovely um it was you know ready to go and then we had one of these storms, which seemed to be unfortunately more frequently. And at the time, uh, there was a big old willow tree all right in the middle of the snowdrop lawn. And you can see it there. Um, it's no longer in the middle of the snowdrop lawn because in that photograph, it's on its side. It's since been cut away. But I always thought it was hilarious that all the snowdrops in that big tuff of grass or in the big kind of sod that came up with the plate of that willow tree managed to do their thing. They grew there. And actually, to this day, that plate is still there and it's still on its side. And those snowdrops have still grown away quite happily. Um, so people often do that when you're putting in bulbs and things. It doesn't matter if you put them upside down or if you put them on their side or you put them on a steep bank. They will still do. Um, they love getting winter dry um, or sorry, not winter dry, summer dry. Uh, so if they put on a really steep bank like that, they're generally no problem at all. They come from areas of the world where they don't get a lot of water in the summer. So they don't need a huge amount of attention in that sense. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, the wall garden here for 30 years was idle. And that's why we had willow trees of this size growing in it. This is just a goat willow of which there are still two or three left. Um, but unfortunately they are, as people know, shallow rooted willow trees and they do blow over occasionally. So our whole garden, which looked lovely just before this talk turned into this uh, chaos of all sorts of trees falling here, there and everywhere. And all we could do is empty the paths and let people around. And uh, anyone who was at that day will remember there was trees kind of toppled like dominoes all over the garden, but it was still beautiful and there was still lots of things to admire and lots of snowdrops to admire and there's something that would have greeted anyone that came to that day uh, that's the main drift of snowdrops as you enter into the Belfield uh, kind of site on the right hand side slightly different now there is a back entrance cutting through that so it's not got the same effect fully this was done by mistake <clears throat> excuse me, Angela had a guy here, Gregor, who was working for her, and she went out and gave him instructions. And Angela would often give instructions, go away for the day and come back. Um, and if you didn't always follow the instructions, which I was also guilty of occasionally, uh, you tended to get an earful of it. Um, and I'm sure Gregor at the time got an earful of it for doing this in this way, because it was not how she meant it to happen. But actually, it turned into a lovely a sea or river of snowdrops. Um, he did it in a very sort of meticulous and uh, I suppose well thought out way, but as it happens, it turned into a lovely um, unusual drift of snowdrops, which everyone used to comment on and still do. Um, you still get it to an, an effect, uh, but it's not quite as uh, good now with the roadway through it. But uh, moving away from snowdrops, I don't want to talk too much about them. And I certainly don't want to talk about them all night to uh, bore you all. 
But these are other plants, which we have lots of here. And this is a great bulb for early spring, Cyclamen coom. So the Cyclamen hedrofolium is the autumn uh, Cyclamen. This is the spring Cyclamen. And you can see here, this is under the red chestnut tree at the front of the house. When it's happy, it is really happy. Um, and this is it growing right at the base in dry shade of a tree, gets very little direct light, um, but they, and it gets very, very little water, I'll tell you that. And the grass hardly grows here at all, which is why we've just got this carpet of cyclamen, um, but they do remarkably well. Uh, cyclamen hedrofolium is the autumn cyclamen, much stronger. The cyclamen coom is the spring cyclamen, really hardy, but it tends to be a little bit um, harder to grow alongside the autumn one. So what we tend to do is we put the autumn one in one part of the garden, the spring one, the coom goes in another part of the garden. And most people, when you think of cyclamen, you think of the bedding plants that you get in the garden centers um, and they just do not do. Um, they're not a plant that, you know, the, generally the bedding plants you get in the garden centers are cyclamen persicum, uh, which are fine. They look lovely. They have big show off flowers, but they're not hardy at all. Uh, whereas the cyclamen coom is as hardy as you like. It was getting, uh, the flowers are on it, a couple of the early flowers are on it now, and it was getting absolutely uh, knocked out there today, and it's doing fine. Here's a photo actually taken in uh, Rory Newell's garden over in Galway a few Christmases ago, and you can see on that the frost has just touched them. It was, uh, I think, around Christmas time. So that's uh, how early they flower. They flower at Christmas time, and they begin to flower then, and they peak around February, March, and they keep flowering into April. Uh, they're one of those plants that you get such value for money for, like hellebores, which I'll talk about later. They give you such a long flowering period, Sycam and Coom, and they really are worth it. And here, uh, it's not just growing on its own, but we do hear lots of kind of combination planting of these bulbs. And this is a few different bulbs grown together, which uh, obviously go to great effect. So the main being the Galanthus nivalis, uh, which Angela put in. The blue that you see there is Iris reticulata harmony, which is a great uh, small dwarf iris. And it has naturalized very well in this area underneath the kind of more rough uh, beach of it. And you can see in the back, it just pots it blue all the way through. It has done remarkably well, um, which is great to see. The sycamine coom is there as well. You can see there's a little bit of aconite, which I'll touch on in a bit. But that combination is really lovely. And this is one of my favorite areas in the garden, even though it's just under the trees at the front of the house. It seems to have something flowering in it from around now. At the moment, there's three or four clumps of snowdrops mid-January. And right until end of sort of April time into May, there's always going to be something flowering in this patch. It's one of those kind of really strong, uh, you know, lots of great value early on in the year. And then it goes in the summertime and turns into long grass and cow parsley. And that's fine, too. And this is kind of one of the uh, pictures of Belfield that everyone stops and goes, wow. Um, this is, as I said before, underneath that uh, pink or red chestnut at the front of the house. The combination here of the cyclamen coom, which you can see the pink cyclamen. Angela used to go and get all of the dark ones. So she used to go and pick the dark ones out of the trays so much now that you can even buy the dark ones um, from lots of suppliers because uh, the dark cyclamen coom uh, is just so much nicer in a situation like that. I think it's called Ruby Star, the very, very dark variety. Um, and we will have both of these for sale on our open days here. Uh, and they'll also have them up in Altamont plants uh, for the Snowdrop Gala for anyone who's interested in them. But they're combined with all those different snowdrops. So look at the snowdrops. If you just uh, take a minute, look at them there. There's some quite small ones. There's some fat leaf, taller ones with less flower. There are some ones that have only opened with small buds on them. There's some that have nearly gone over. Uh, there's such variation and combination in that. And I think that's the kind of key to Belfield. Um, we don't have just one snowdrop in one spot. We've got all those different varieties and variations. And Angela was great. Angela wasn't always fantastic at naming all of these snowdrops and putting out the names, but she was great at trying them in areas where most people wouldn't. We've got one snowdrop called Green Tear, which some of you will know uh, if you're collectors, which is quite an expensive bulb still, really beautiful dark green plant. And it's grown out in an area of kind of damp woodland where you would not expect it to grow. And it does absolutely fine. And it's quite extraordinary that it's doing so well. So she was trying things and when they worked, they really did work. And this is one of those areas that she kept adding to. She kept planting cyclamen and coom here. Uh, that's not to say that this didn't have loads and loads of plants. And you have to appreciate that too. There was loads of plants put in here, but it really made a difference. And the other, you can see the crocus popping up, which I'll talk about in a minute. I'm going to fly through now daffodils. I realize that I'm probably talking a bit longer than I should. Um, but these are the daffodils. Philip will interrupt me um, probably when the hour is up maybe or something, so I don't go over too much. But these are daffs. Um, 
And I just want to mention how I grow daffodils and how we grow them here. This year, we were very fortunate. Esker Farm daffodils, which are based up in Northern Ireland, and now have a huge snowdrop collection too. Uh, so for anyone interested in getting into snowdrops, Esker Farm daffodils are one of the newest and uh, I suppose one of the bigger suppliers now of snowdrops in the country. But they obviously, daffodils are their main thing. Uh, they gave us this year an absolute load of uh, daffodils and we've potted them all. And the reason I pot them all is I show you here in this photograph. This was my own garden, or my parents' garden in Carlow years ago. I bought loads of different varieties of daffodil. And as you can see there, daffodils come in loads of different varieties. If you think snowdrops are bad, daffodils are worse. There's about 3,000 named snowdrops. There's about 27,000 named daffodils. So nine times the problem when it comes to daffs. There are a bit more variation in them though. But I plant them in pots. I then sink the pots into a bed. And what I do then is when they're up in full bloom like this, I move them around the garden. And that does two things. Number one, you can see how tall they are, what color they are, where they will go, what combinations will or won't work if you're trying to get the garden looking you know, at its absolute best. And the other thing that it does, when you're planting these bulbs in the autumn time, I'm sure many of you have done it, you're digging up a plant or you're digging ground, putting in a snowdrop or a daffodil bulb that you want and you really have a place for it. And then next thing you hit another daffodil or another snowdrop or something else that you've planted there before, because we all are guilty of over planting our gardens. But if you put them in pots and put them in the area when they're all up when everything else is up you tend to not know then to dig in the places where there's only gaps so it's one good way of being able to grow lots of snowdrops or lots of daffodils I should say sorry I have snowdrops in the brain and this is just one of the oldest varieties it's around since the 16th century uh, my grandmother and my mom I think took this from an old abandoned cottage in Mayo and that's where you often find this variety of Narcissus van Sion and um, it's been around for an awful long time since I think the 15th or 16th century. It's a double daffodil. You can see here, lovely doubling, quite varied. Um, but it, for some reason, double plants, uh, the double snowdrop is the same. They tend to persist. And this is a great one that persists for an awful long time uh, in gardens. And is just a great all-rounder plant, which again, has been left there and neglected by the side of the bins at home. This is in Carlo and it's doing fine after all them years. Uh, again, this is a, my parents' place in Carlo. And this is just a, daffodil that you can't be without. Um, doesn't matter how much of a gardener you are, you can't not but love Narcissus tete a tete. We have it here sprinkled out throughout parts of the woodland um, on the right hand side there. It was given to me in a bucket by somebody who had it and over the years I've been digging it out and spreading it. So basically now that whole bed is basically yellow for a few weeks of the year and they come up, they flower, they're small, they're dainty, they're dwarf as well so they don't have huge dirty tatty foliage which some daffodils can have it's a bit mean since dirty tatty foliage but daffodils can uh, but tete tet does not and it's cousin uh, tet boucle uh, that's an awful uh, way of pronouncing french and i apologize to anyone uh, i'm sure it's someone who'll say it better but tet boucle boucle anyhow uh, it's a double version of that same plant and it is a fantastic one as well just as nice as tete a tete, but it's a double and as a result lasts a bit longer and gives you a little bit more interest and is very easily got now from all the suppliers uh, in different places uh, across. And this is just um, a side note here, I suppose, myself and Angela, um, when I was working with her, actually it wasn't, it was when I was working in the UK, uh, she rang me one day and she said, I'm coming down to Cornwall, uh, where are you? Can you meet me such and such a place? So I met her outside of Bath, and we hopped down to Cornwall and we went to this place, which was Ron Scamp's um, Daffodils. He's got a place called Quality Daffodils, which is on the kind of Cornish Devon border, I think. Could be wrong there. But anyhow, the story here is during the Second World War, uh, Cornwall was a place where all of the market um, daffodils were grown for London. And there was loads of ancient varieties, uh, ancient but old varieties, which have been grown for hundreds and hundreds of years. And when the war happened, the Second World War, the Dig for Victory campaign came in and all the farmers were told they had to now turn their land over to productive use. So all the farmers in the area had no choice, even if they grew these daffodils, which were a good cash crop for them, they had to dig them up. And what they did often was they threw them in the old hedgerows and then they turned their fields over to cultivating crops for the war effort. And Ron Scamp went around and spent his whole life going into these hedgerows all around the Cornish and Devon countrysides and collecting these old varieties, which had often been lost and may not have been in cultivation for a long time. And he brought them back here and he's grown them in this place. So all of these are small bunches of uh, the varieties. Uh, and Esker Farm, as I mentioned earlier, their uh, place is very much like this. Um, I saw it in the autumn time. I haven't seen it in spring yet, but they grow a small selection of older varieties, uh, very, very often with Irish connections. Uh, Brian Duncan, who had the place before them uh, at the company, Company was very good at collecting and breeding and also growing these old varieties as well as new modern ones. This is just another little 
small little bulb, Narcissus cyclaminus. Um, it's a great little alpine uh, Narcissus, grows very well here. Um, grows exceptionally well in Carlo, uh, despite it being dry, and I've heard that it does prefer a slightly damper spot, but every year it comes up. Uh, it looks like it's got its uh, hair caught in the wind. Um, it's got very, very reflex outer petals here for a daffodil, but small little dainty alpine one, which is a great early Narcissus as well, which is quite nice. And another very early Narcissus is this one. This is flowering outside at the moment in a pot. I bought it uh, probably five or six years ago from Farmer Gracie, uh, maybe not that long ago. And I've discovered the key to growing Narcissus bulbocodium is just utter neglect. Uh, plant it and forget about it. And this has been in the same pot now for five or six years. Every year I forget about it. I throw it around the back of the garage or somewhere here and I bring it out then the end of autumn and it gets watered and all of a sudden it comes up and it flowers beautifully. This year it's been so neglected that the pot that it was in has fallen apart and it is now there sitting bare root without a pot in it and it's still flowering away. Um, so it's one of those plants that just, you can't, I mean, they're quite meant to be quite difficult to grow, but I've always found them, uh, the best way to do them is to uh, neglect it nearly. And this is another cute little daffodil uh, if you want to grow something small and a kind of collectory thing. Narcissus rupicola, that is my own hand holding onto it there. So you can see it's absolutely tiny. It's between my index and ring finger. Um, tiny, beautiful little dwarf narcissus. There's a whole load of dwarf narcissus out there and they are beautiful and often highly scented too. Um, and this is another, uh, I suppose I would call it a great daffodil because I find it such a difficult one to grow, but it's one that everyone wants to grow. It's Narcissus Cedric Morris, um, which has grown, uh, for lots of people, it flowers very, very early, probably one of the first ones to flower. But it seems to be a plant that's very difficult to bulk up and to source. Um, and it's always one that's hard to get. So it's one of those ones that you kind of wonder why. But there's a couple of other early um, ones. I think there's a one I have called Dawn Chorus, which is a very early one, which I nearly would prefer to this because um, it nearly does better than Narcissus Cedric Morris, which can be a little bit finicky and hard to get your hands on. And this is, and then another bit of an oddity. Uh, this is one that we found at that show when we went down to see Ron Scamp, Narcissus Misa Verda. And you can see there, it's got a beautiful green tinge to the flower. Um, and that is because it has what we uh, call a little bit of Narcissus viridiflorus in its parentage. And viridiflorus, for anyone who doesn't know it, is a small species uh, from, I think, the Mediterranean, from Spain in particular, and really small, dark green, uh, really highly scented, and Mesa Verda, lovely scent, and obviously it has that green uh, tinge to it, which is very unusual. Um, I grew it for a while. It's a difficult thing to grow if you're trying to grow it in the ground, but in a pot I grew it for a couple of years, and it was more than happy. And this is one I've grown in a pot for the last couple of years, Sabine Hay, Beautiful coloration, and that's the thing. Daffodils give you so much more color. That's nearly got a. I don't know how you describe that yellow. Um, it's certainly not a butter yellow or a whatever type of yellow. It's a, a very dark, dusty yellow. But I love it, and the orange as well, a very uh, distinct color, and that has grown well. And again, that was very easily available. That's a very uh, good one. And this is an accident. I got this by mistake. What's uh, from me flew over in the Netherlands uh, and I bought it not knowing what it was it turned out to be and that's photograph doesn't do it justice I have it at home um, and I have it this year for Belfield because I just love it um, it's the most pure ivory white daffodil and perfectly shaped narcissus I've ever grown and had and I've just really really love it um, I got it this year it has big bulbs and it's just a really stunning uh, daffodil, which has been one that when I first grew it, I didn't think I'd love it. I think I meant to get a different type and it really caught my imagination. And I went, wow, um, I'm glad I have that. So it's a really great one to keep your eyes out for. A little bit harder to get. And Poeticus, um, I mentioned about putting daffodils in the lawn. This is the pheasant eye daffodil, Narcissus Poeticus, and it does so well when you put it into naturalized areas, particularly damp lawns, of which we have many here in Belfield. And just as a side note, this is uh, when we were down in Ron Scamps, uh, there was a big pile of old daffodils outside his workshop, or his shed, I should say. And he said to us, we can take whatever we want from that. And I went through and picked out one or two things. And this is one I picked out from that big, big pile. And I've always loved it because I don't know, I hope the color looks OK on your computer. But the, it's the darkest kind of orange, which is nearly red that I've ever seen in a daffodil and it always stands out and it hasn't bulked up particularly well. It's been quite slow. It has started to do a little bit more, but it's always caught my attention where I've grown it in Carlo for a long number of years. I don't know what it's called, may never know what it's called, but it's a lovely old, probably very old variety, uh, which has a very distinct color. Maybe it's a new variety that he just didn't think was worthy of naming, but I've always thought it's nice and it has that story attached to it. And again, it's not about growing them, 
uh, individually. It's growing them on mass. It's growing them in those lawn areas. It's growing them here in Belfield at the front of the house alongside the anemone, um, which does very well here, the blue wood anemone. Uh, that's where I think daffodils are at their best when you grow them like that on mass, not individually, but when you grow them here and with lots of different varieties. Um, I have, couldn't find a photograph, but in my grandparents' garden in Carlow when I was smaller, it used to have, instead of a lawn, it just had loads and loads of daffodils and they were all different colours and heights and shapes and sizes and everything. And it was lovely. Um, and I think that's how daffodils should be grown. And we've done that this year. Esker very kindly donated us loads of daffodils. So we've probably planted nearly a thousand or so in one of our lawns. So hopefully in the next couple of years, it mightn't happen straight away, but we'll have this effect in some of the wall garden. Moving on to another bulb. Uh, just tulips. Uh, I'm going to quickly mention some of the best ones here. Queen of the Night, that dark, rich, uh, vibrant tulip. Uh, very tall too, so it's great for the border. Um, not so great for pots. Um, and this is it in Belfield going back many, many years. And Belfield has a great, uh, had a great tulip collection, probably not so much now. But last year, for some reason, we had great tulips in the garden without planting very few at all. So hopefully that will change over the next while. Um, and you can see here, this was what this was what we call the orange border. Uh, going back a good few years uh, when the tulips were at their peak. And this is around the pond area. Um, the, I was actually putting this in there. Maybe I shouldn't put this in. Uh, I'll just note this was long before the RHSI took over. This was when Angela was here and the lawn was sprayed off uh, because Angela did use chemicals, but we haven't used chemicals at all since we've taken over. Um, but I wanted to show you the pots because uh, when it comes to pots, and I'll talk about them in a minute, more is more. And you just have to fill pots with plants, uh, especially tulips and bulbs to get that effect. And you can see here, it's probably, I don't know, want to even guess how many bulbs are in those two containers there, the big old buckets, tear buckets from the grain factory, but they're amazing and they do look very, very well. And like that, it's all when it's on mass. One or two tulips look lovely, but when you have them on mass, you really get the effect. And I'm just going to flick through showing you the garden with all those daffodils and tulips. That's a daffodil called White Lady, which we have lots of, a very old variety, highly scented and a beautiful, elegant kind of form to it as well. And this is around the folly area when you grow some of these plants together. So lots of spring plants in here. Hellebores, there's magnolia, there's obviously daffodils, there's primrose, there's umphaloides. Uh, there's a little bit of everything and you get that lovely chocolate box combination. There's the anemones. Um, unfortunately, that area has declined in the last couple of years, but uh, it is a great little tapestry of what you can do by combining all of these plants together. Um, and we will try to recreate that in parts of the garden here in time. And again, looking through the garden in springtime, uh, it's looking lovely and just you've got endless bloom and endless interest in the garden when you have it at that time. Just mentioning a couple of the species tulips um, and I'll mention a few of the bigger ones. Species ones are great, particularly if you want to put them into grass, which I want to do more and more of here. So again, I'm more interested in growing these bulbs in the lawns nowadays than I am in the borders. Uh, this is on the left, Cynthia which is great. And on the right, peppermint stick, which I've grown in the lawns different times here, and it's done well on each occasion. Um, they're great, uh, small ones. Uh, peppermint stick tends to be better in the lawns than Cynthia. Cynthia is a bit smaller, dwarf, and very early, but it doesn't make it any more um, beautiful. And fly away, I'll show you a better photo of fly away in a few minutes. Um, really lovely uh, tulip, which does exceptionally well and has came back for me. It has been a reliable perennial in a pot for three years in a row now. Uh, which isn't always the case for tulips. So, um, and I don't know whether that's just because I neglect the pots and don't give them any water or not, but it has came back uh, very reliably over the last three years. And this is another one I love for an alpine uh, tray, the Tulip Corolla Oculata Alba, which has got that really, really interesting uh, purpley black kind of, yeah, it's a strange color and very, very small, not significant plant really but it really just stands out and pops and you get a bit of spring light on that on a nice day it really makes you go wow um, it is a beautiful tulip and here's one uh, may divide opinions uh, may not be so beautiful but I always like the oddities I like the odd and the quirky and the different and the things that make people go hmm uh, what's that or is that so great this is tulip go go red um, which is, uh, yeah, uh, make up your own opinion on it, I suppose. Uh, you either like it or love it. It's um, or like it or hate it, I should say. It's a marmite kind of tulip, marmite plant, but uh, we have to grow some of them in our gardens too to get people's attention. Um, speaking of getting people's attention, this might get your attention um, because I have been rabbit on a while, but I want to uh, mention lasagnas. And I don't want to mention lasagnas because I'm not going to give you a cookery lesson, but I want to mention them because I want to show you very briefly how I grow and how we grow here in Belfield 
our pots of tulips and bulbs in particular, um, not just um, our tulips, but everything. Uh, so the lasagna, and by lasagna, the whole thing here, as you can see, the lasagnas are in their lovely layers. Um, and that is why uh, we grow them, uh, how we better grow them. Um, and this is just how we do it. So we put a small bit of compost in the bottom of the pot, we put in our bulbs, and then we layer it up. So we put another layer of compost and we put another layer of bulbs. And what we do is we put the largest bulbs at the bottom of the pot, about three quarters of the way down-ish. And then we keep going up and up and up and up to the smallest bulbs at the top. So in this example, the tulips go in the bottom, often the daffodils go in the bottom. The next layer then would be something maybe like uh, crocus, uh, fritillaria, cilias, whatever you have, you layer, 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 layer the whole way to the top. And in one pot, you could put 50, 60 and more bulbs. And I would even put them nearly a little bit closer than that. But you could put a lot of bulbs in the pot. Um, and there's an example of it on the side. You just put the biggest in the bottom, smallest going up to the very smallest in the top. And you can do three layers, you can do four, you can do five, you can do two, one, even if you want. But the more you put in, obviously, the more you get and the more succession flowering. And this is one that I did a couple of years ago. Um, I used tin buckets. I got old tin buckets from the hardware that were being sold off for half nothing, drilled holes in them. You have to drill holes in your buckets if you're going to put bulbs in them or whatever container. You will not grow tulips or any plant if you're trying to grow it without a hole in the bucket. Um, so these are just tin galvanized buckets filled with layers and layers and layers of uh, all these tulips and various different plants. And they did very well. The unfortunate thing there was COVID happened, so I never got to see them fully flower. But I did get to see other ones fully flower. And this is just to show you, this is in an old granite trough, but this is given a little example of the succession. Uh, on the right hand side, the crocus there, um, and then the crocus are replaced on the left by the scylla and the purple viola. You can put a layer of uh, spring bedding on the top. I often put viola because they last all through the winter and they flower their socks off well into spring. Uh, the one thing I would mark, mark about that photo is that probably wasn't enough plants in there. When it comes to pots, more is more. Um, it's not often in gardening you say that and you want to be careful, but when it comes to pots, you really do need to pack them in to get the impact that you really want. So that's just showing that. And this is how I grow them at home in Carlo when I lived there with my parents. This is the back door of the house, which is always a concrete pad. And I always like to um, judge it up a bit. So we put in loads of different containers, old tin baths, old chimney pots, old terracotta pots. Uh, some of them are just plastic pots hidden away that you can't see. And in all of those pots, I put different plants, some spring plants, there's some polyanthus and primrose there, but mainly layers and layers of these lasagna plantings, which you can see there. This was a crocus time with a couple of the violas poking through. And this was a little bit later on that year with the daffodils and the hyacinths poking through. And I also uh, add combine a few bits of dwarf conifers, which work well in those kind of scenarios. And I do like um, this are the tin baths, uh, the hyacinth uh, woodstock, which is a great one, and the daffodil called Caris, which is a lovely um, one with its reflex petals and a kind of interesting uh, lighter color than the rest. And then these are just them as they go through the season. So the tulips uh, are starting to come on and the daffodils wane off. So you, every single couple of weeks, you come back and they change. I was working away when this was planted and I came back every few weeks and it changed dramatically all the time. Um, and here was it pretty much at its peak with the tulips coming there. I think there's ballerina tulip in the background, that orange. Uh, the dark red tulip, I think, is Oscar. And at the front is Charade or Orange Princess. Uh, orange princess i think is in the next yeah that's charade and orange princess is at the front of this photo so uh some lovely tulips that did very well and you can see there's muscari and other bulbs thrown in there too and this is it just showing you in its combination that's orange princess the smaller one at the front different heights too so you get all sorts of lovely combinations um and you get that kind of you know succession planting which is lovely and works very very well and this is it uh, i think this was the year before so slightly different scheme uh, with that fly away, which I spoke about earlier uh, at the front there with that yellow and orange and Alexander Pushkin, which is another very good tall tulip. Um, and it's great. You can grow tall tulips in pots here and get away with it. Um, and it works very well. And I layer it up. You can see at the back, I put a big uh, tin dustbin, much like Helen Dillon used to do. And at the front, the smaller ones. So you get that kind of tiered layer effect, uh, much like Klaus Dalby does over um, in Denmark, I think is where he's based. So crocus then, I'm going to mention these. Um, crocus thomasianus, they're lovely little plants, they're fine like that in a pot, but if you're going to grow crocus, uh, you want to do something like this. And this is my neighbours, I went over, I was given a tip off that he might have a few snowdrops, so I went over one day with a trowel, um, kind of, and begging, could I take a few snowdrops? Turns out he had no snowdrops, but uh, what he did have was probably 50,000 crocus thomasianus growing under this ancient chestnut tree, which has been there for 
I wouldn't want to even hazard a guess how old the chestnut tree is. And it's amazing. And this is it now with dusk, so it wasn't great photographs, but you can see endless, endless crocus. Um, and there are different variations there too, because they've been seeding around and hybridizing for many, many years. And another great crocus that I do love, crocus orange monarch, which works very, very well. And crocus firefly, which I've naturalized with snowdrops at home in the grass. Um, and we'll try here as well, because it is a great early, early crocus, which is up pretty much now. Aconites or Aranthus, I mentioned them earlier, they're great combination plants to grow with your snowdrops. Um, they come up early, uh, they last a long time, and they do very, very well. So they are a great one to add to that. And you can get all of these lovely uh, long German names, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. Um, and then you get some of the species ones on the right, which you need to be growing glasshouses. I think that's one called Bifidata, but you really need a glasshouse to grow that plant. So you have to be a little bit careful. Muscari, another great bulb. Um, the thing about them in that photo shows it pretty well. I love muscari, great piacins, but they awful. They have awful tatty foliage. Um, the normal one, which you get, and it, it, we have it here. Even grows in the pots, it's seeded into the pots in Belfield. But it just, I always think it looks tatty, no matter what you do with it. But thankfully, there are a few redeeming uh, varieties which are out there. Latifolium is much better, um, not as bad. And golden fragrance, as you can see there, its foliage is nearly uh, a feature in its own right, um, and it also has very, very different coloration compared to those blues that you normally get and just mention a few more fritillarias uh, lovely for damp um, love fritillarias in a damper setting because they do so well um, and we have lots of damp here in Belfield and they do very 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 happily there um, and they grow and naturalize lovely a bit later on in the season this is the blue border in Belfield um, in all its madness of kind of in May into June but that is the allium purple sensation that you see there combined with the catmint the catmint is doing the job of hiding the allium leaves, which can be a bit ugly. The purple sensation seed themselves around there and they have been naturalizing and seeding themselves everywhere uh, and really creating a stunning effect through the garden. Another allium, bit of an oddity. I again like the oddity sometimes. This is one called allium hair. I'm always a bit wary of new alliums because they, some of them can be ever so slightly invasive depending where you are. So just be, uh, take them in a pinch of salt and be wary if you're not sure of them. But I've always thought that's a bit of a, you know, maybe not beautiful, but certainly a different plant to grow. Now moving into a few combination plants for them. Hellebores, there's loads of different hellebores. This is the stinking hellebore, hellebore fetidus. Uh, another hellebore that's great, one flowering right now, hellebore argutifolius. It flowers quite early. Um, it's big, big hellebore. And you can see there on the right left hand photo, there's a bumblebee there. So it shows you how important it is uh, to have early flowering plants in the garden because you do need, uh, you know, plants that uh, will give you early pollen and give uh, things to insects early in the year. And then hellebore purpurescens, which is the pair, one of the parents of all of these lovely hybrids that we grow. So I don't even have photos of the hybrids, but, and I think the next one shows you, yeah, these are the parents of the double hybrids that we grow, Dideo and Aeneas, which are Hellebore torcatus. And basically what's happened is all these ones I've shown you before have been crossed by breeders over the last hundreds of years. And what you buy in a garden center now is a Hellebore it tends to be what they sell as Hellebore X hybridist. So it's cross hybridist because it's a hybrid Hellebore. They can't give it one name or another because it's basically a hybrid of all these different things, taking all the characteristics of the lovely color of that, the early flowering of that and the foliage of that to create all the hybrids that we grow in our gardens now. Uh, an early plant that I love a little bit later in the season, but still in springtime, Chrysis blinum davidianum, a fantastic woodland plant that will carpet the ground very, very easily. Um, it's, I think, a member of the cabbage family, bizarrely, and it doesn't have flowers. I don't know, I don't think the next photo is here, but it doesn't actually have flowers. It has actual bracts, which is great. If you ever want a plant to last a long time, don't have a flower, have a bract, because bracts last far longer than flowers. No, I don't have it, um, but they do flower for an awful long time, and they will spread along happily in a damp shade. Uh, the Sporum longistylum, which is uh, a bit of an oddity too, but a great woodland plant, and it has uh, beautiful flowers varied. There's one called Night Heron, which has got a lovely dark flower. This is just one uh, that Krug Farm had over in the UK. And Hepaticas, I'm going to mention them because they're a lovely early spring plant. They're not a plant you can really grow uh, apart from a couple of varieties in the ground, but a lot of these Japanese varieties, Hepatica japonica, they all need glasshouse cultivation but they are kind of the new snowdrops because people will pay hundreds, and I mean hundreds of euros for individual plants of some of these hepatica. Haruno Oakii is that one. These next couple are ones I got from John Massey actually um, in the UK from 
can't think of the name of his place now. Someone will remind me later. But that is uh, just some of the plants. John Massey has loads of hepatica and the hepaticas are doing very, very well. Uh, and they grow fine in pots and they are okay as long as you don't keep them outside all year round. Polygonatums, uh, this is a lovely early polygonatum and it has that weird thing of flowering early, it's evergreen, so it looks good all year round. And it has that, as you can see there, the flower and the fruit are on at the same time if you grow it in the right place, um, which is a bit of an oddity. It needs a bit of a warmer part of the garden. I wouldn't put it in a cold frost pocket, but it is a beautiful polygonatum and it's probably changed its name recently. Uh, and this is a, another spring oddity. Uh, this is one that would love this weather at the moment uh, because when we grew these in Creek Farm plants, we used to actually often bring them into the freezer and put them in the chest freezer for a few days to trigger them into flowering. Uh, they seem to love growing cold and I think they're from Japan um, originally, Pteridophyllum racemosum. Everyone calls it the fern with the flower. It's not a fern. Uh, if a fern had a flower, it wouldn't be a fern, but these all have fern-like foliage and lovely white flowers. Um, um, again, it's a little strange. It can be a difficult thing to grow, but once you get it right, and if you are willing to play around and try to put it in the freezer, you might be able to have it grown. And this is one that you don't need to play around to put it in the freezer. Uh, it's a great saxifrage uh, that will spread all over your woodland garden. We've got a few of them out here, which are starting to romp away in the new areas of planting. Uh, saxifrage, stolen it for a kinky purple, uh, BSWJ4972. Uh, so that basically means that Bledon and Sue and Jones collected that. And I know that they collected it in, I think, the Kinky Mountains in India uh, originally. And the right hand side, you can see the flowers, quite a tall flower spike, really bright flowers as well, because if that grows in dark, dense shade, which it will do quite happily, the white flowers of that are tall and they really stand out and they can brighten up a dark corner of the garden very well. This is just uh, Bezia which is a beautiful plant. Um, oddity again, we saw it growing in Bodmin this year uh, to great effect in some of the woodland areas around there. And it's got it's got flowers, as you can see, the flowers are sort of so-so. It's one of those plants that you really grow for the foliage. And when you see the foliage on mass grown well, lovely evergreen heart-leaved foliage, um, I always think it's worth um, growing it. Uh, and it's a great, great uh, plant for that. Just to give you then very briefly, I know I've been rabbiting on, but I want to just explain to you about splitting up and dividing snowdrops and in particular uh, well in particular snowdrops most bulbs this applies to but in snowdrops particularly i mentioned earlier john long was a snowdrop that i got from robert miller as a couple of bulbs a few years ago look what it's done this is john long in the garden here in carlo and it is just grumping and that's from a few bulbs has turned into this almighty clump and robert came over one day and he said god you need to dig that up and divide it or you might end up losing it because uh, snowdrops are a bit finicky like that and also it's a perfect opportunity to make more of them so off i went took it up um you dig up snowdrops very easily they're very shallow rooted compared to other bulbs you try to dig it that hill, you might have to go down nearly a foot snowdrops come up very easily and i didn't do a lot of effort to get that snowdrop up out of the ground divided them apart so that was pulling them out into their clumps. And I was trying to get a fistful size clump. You can be very mean and put them nearly in ones and twos and occasionally it will do that. But in this case, I wasn't being so mean. So I pulled them out into kind of clumps that will fit into my hand basically. So nice few bulbs there. You can see maybe five or six more in that particular clump and they're doing very well. So divided them all out from that. I got, I think nearly 12 decent clumps um, and I could have been much meaner, but I wasn't. Put them back into the ground with their foliage a bit falling over the place. Doesn't matter. Put them in roughly at the same level of where they came out. Spread them over that whole area. So instead of having one clump now, I'm going to have a drift in that area. That was them in, I think, the end of 22. And in 23, this is what they did. So all of those little ones came and they flowered in this lovely clump here and did very, very well, which was lovely to see. Uh, I'm going to very briefly mention this because I know I've been going on, but this is about how to be put off something, I call it, because it's uh, most people who propagate snowdrops in particular uh, will propagate them using this method, which is called twin scaling, which is a very complicated process, which involves cutting up the bulbs into small little slices like this. So you cut it into half and eight and sixteenth, uh, and you then split them up and you put them into bags of vermiculite, which you can see on the left hand of that or the right hand of that photo. And then you grow them on and on the right hand there is what happens, the bulb comes through. It's a very complex, uh, you need to do it in a sterile environment. You have to be careful with when you do it, you have to do it in the dormant season. But if you have a bulb that's worth 100 euro and you divide it into 16 pieces, well, you can do the maths and you can understand why that might be a lucrative thing that people will do. And what happens is you grow these little tiny chips, which is if you ever grow snowdrops from seed, this is what you'll get. You won't get snowdrops 
flowers for at least two or three years if you grow them from seed. And the same with these. For the first years after you do this, you'll only get small little tiny things, which will then turn into bigger plants. And this was Tom's collection. He was, uh, as you can see, an obsessive galanthophile. He grew all of his in aquatic pots, which lots of people do to stop them contaminating. And we had them then coming up in the springtime with all their varieties, and they did uh, quite well. But this was all the little bits we had divided out. So basically, we spent the whole summer filling these polytunnels with all these thousands and I think we did 50,000 chips in a summer. But it's one way of propagating them, but it's also one way of falling fully out of love with snowdrops. But thankfully, now that I'm working back in Belfield, um, I've seen the light again and realized that snowdrops are well worth growing and are a beautiful plant. Just as a thing, people ask this all the time. What do you use as your potting mix? Uh, I can honestly say that it varies a lot. It all varies with what's on hand, but this is what I try to do as much as I possibly can. So about a quarter loam, um, John Innes compost is often very good. You can buy loam if you've got a source of it, great. Uh, grit or sand about a quarter for bulbs. Uh, bulbs like good drainage, so better drainage the, or more drainage the better. Peat-free multipurpose compost, uh, which we've got at the moment from Fruit Hill Farm here and farm yard manure or garden compost, which we've got lots of at the moment, thankfully. Um, and instead of loam, uh, sometimes here I use leaf mold because we've loads of leaf mold and uh, it has a similar effect. It holds onto moisture and it is very good. And again, we have it. Often it's what you ever have to hand you need to make these mixes up with. That varies, but generally speaking about a uh, quarter, quarter, quarter of all those different things combined, you get a lovely free draining uh, bulb mix that bulbs will love. And this is just, we're going to, I'm going to end up and promise in a minute or two, got a few more. It's just at the front of Belfield, uh, the meadow. Um, when Angela passed away, I came back to the garden a few days after she died. And this was a site that greeted me, which I always will remember um, whenever Angela's anniversary is, which is in May. Uh, the meadow at the front of Belfield with the tulip. I think red shine is what she had in it, along with a few others. It varied over the years, but I always thought red tulips in a green meadow like that with very little else uh, was always a stunning thing. And uh, the fact that it was the, pretty much the first thing I saw when I got out of the car, uh, having returned to Belfield, having heard the news about Angela, it was one of those things that kind of uh, struck me and I always will remember. And just to uh, give you a little bit here about Belfield, um, this is Belfield of old. Um, this photograph was taken in about 1926 um, and Belfield used to be a hunting lodge and it was also a place where uh, obviously they had the hunt and it was uh, a stud farm I should say for an awful long time and it had the hunt here every single uh, winter time and in the photograph there at the front you'll see along the front row there are a few children in um, particular try pay attention to the right hand side of the front door there is a little curly haired uh, girl uh, standing with uh, probably her mother uh, at the front there and just keep an eye on that because uh, that little girl here is also in this photograph that was taken in 2023. Um, she's in the red on the right hand side, still at the right hand side of the door uh, and that's our neighbour Mrs Mabel Wallace who last year uh, celebrated her 100th birthday and she's in her 101st year now. She still drives um, she's a remarkable woman. And every year, the reason we took this photograph was she actually got us to uh, go through Belfield and we collected daffodils, um, which she does every single year. We collected them and she bundles them up and then sells them down in the local centre for the Irish Cancer Society on Daffodil Day. And uh, these are the daffodils we collected last year. She bundled them all up and I think she raised nearly three and a half thousand euros. So she's a remarkable woman. Um, she's uh, one of our uh, closest neighbours here and a great friend to Belfield and was also a great friend of Angela's. So we're very lucky to have uh, that, you know, the continuity here in Belfield and people who have known the house for uh, as long as Mabel, which in her case, she's known the house for 95 plus years. Um, so it's quite remarkable and we're delighted every time she comes to visit us here. And this is just Belfield um, here at the front, uh, the meadow, which uh, I showed you with the tulips there with the haycocks. And this is a little bit of what we're doing. We're doing uh, some strange and different things, which include checkerboard lawns and uh, bulb lawns. Uh, as I said, I don't like cutting grass. So if I can get away with it any way possible, this is just to give you a little other things you can do in your garden. And final two things I want to show. Uh, you might think it's hard to grow snowdrops. Um, not always is the case. Uh, snowdrops tend to want to survive. Most plants want to survive. Dried snowdrops are useless. Um, if you're ever buying snowdrops in the autumn time from a source where they're drying up in bags, don't buy them. They do not do well as dried bulbs. They hate being dried out. Unlike daffodils, which can get dried out fully, snowdrops basically will die if they're drying out as much as you will do there. So instead of putting your snowdrops and letting them dry out, 
uh, buy them in the green. And this is what I did. I dug them up here. I left them in a pot when I was doing a project years ago. I washed all the soil off of them. So that's just pure bulbs sitting in a damp pot in the humidity of the Irish climate. And up they grew without any soil, without anything at all flowering away in a pot. So you don't always have to give them the best of conditions for them to flower and grow. So if you get the right snowdrop bulbs, the right stock, they will grow regardless, but just never buy dried snowdrop bulbs because they just will not grow. Buy them in the green, buy them um, or get them from a friend. Uh, don't go buying dried snowdrops. Yeah, that's one guaranteed way of not seeing many snowdrops next year. And just when it comes to pests and disease, you've always got to be careful with these things. If you see bulbs that are like this, anyway damaged, if they have fungus on them, um, Tulips have got awful problems the last couple of years with viruses. Um, snowdrops and daffs can often carry things if they're anyway soft. Just discard the bulb and ideally burn them or put them in the landfill, bin them. Don't have them hanging around. You don't want to spread diseases. So we plant thousands of bulbs here every year. And if there's anything that looks anyway dodgy, I've now just got to the point where they just get binned straight away. There's no hanging around. Uh, it's just not worth it when you're planting as many uh, and you want your garden to be looking brilliant. Uh, so that's it. Thank you all for listening. Sorry for going on for so long. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has about anything that we mentioned tonight. Thank you, Paul. A, a tour de force, um, content, packed with content, packed with beautiful images, um, loads, loads in there. I'm going to run through the comments. Um, it's just a celebration of Belfield, of Snowdrops, of Angela, of springtime. It's fantastic. Now, Claire McNally helped you with the the source of the of the the snowdrop being the Crimea. Where do you yes. buy bulbs? Anne would like to know. Where, what give us some sources? Now you have mentioned uh, Esker Farm. Anybody else? Yeah, I've mentioned Esker, um, Altamont plants in County Carlo are great. Uh, Gord Kelly Nursery, which I think Claire now calls herself Cold Blow Nursery here in Shinron, um, has a good few field of blooms. He's on line. Guy has some in Ireland um lots of suppliers the snowdrop gala they will have various people there um where else can you buy them uh, beach Hill bulbs in county offaly in tullamore uh they're a great one for large quantities of things uh you can get them again from online i try to you know support irish ones where possible but as i said i mentioned farmer gracie and i mentioned peter nyson is another great supplier of more of the harder to source ones slightly more expensive there's no denying that you might pay a bit more but you'll get some of those more difficult to source and i mentioned fluel as well in the netherlands so there's a few good sources out there um but i to be honest every year i buy them from all of those sources i never just go to one supplier i would always go to pretty much every single one of those suppliers and buy an amount some more than others but yeah spread out and uh, go from different suppliers you'll always get a good variation thank you brilliant what can you do when tete tete are eaten by bulb fly? They just rotted. That is, that is a problem. Uh, the Narcissus bulb fly will always attack, will also attack daffodils. What daffodils? Snowdrops. Sorry, um, I'm <laughs> I'm muddling up my bulbs. But it will attack uh, the snowdrops and the daffodils. It looks awful like a wasp. Um, so people will often mistake it for a wasp, but it's very early out, so it isn't. Um, unfortunately, it's a bit of a pest. Uh, all you can do is, if you're not trying to use chemicals, which we're not, and if you have particularly valuable bulbs, the best advice is, as soon as the foliage begins to die away, try and mulch over it to stop the actual grub burying down into it, because the grub, uh, I think the larvae of the Narcissus bulb um, caterpillar, Narcissus bulb fly, I should say, uh, grubs down. So as soon as the foliage dies, what happens is, if you think about it, if you have a pencil in the ground and you pull up the pencil, there's a lovely hole and uh, where that stem of the daffodil has died is a lovely track down right into the middle of the bulb for the daffodil. So if you put a little bit of mulch or something over your more precious ones, it tends to help them. Um, and you need to do that as soon as the foliage goes to offer them. And also let the foliage die down naturally. Don't tie them up. Don't do anything silly like that. Let it happen naturally and then mulch over them is the best thing to do. Thank you very much. Mary is saying wonderful talk has resurrected her enthusiasm. Can't wait for this awful weather to go so I can get out there again. Hanukkah, you Paul. Uh, Ashwood Nurseries is being recommended as well, John Massey. Yeah, uh, that's the one I couldn't think very of. Very good point. Paul, what snowdrops varieties are you using in the grass to naturalize? This could be a long answer. Yeah, maybe. Do you want to rethink that? Um, we're using all of them. Uh, basically, we're using as many as we can get away with. So I um, tend to use pretty much 
every single one that we have and including some of the more rare ones. I mentioned that Angela put in uh, that, what you call it, one called Green Tear. Um, so yeah, we use as many as we possibly can. Um, so basically any of them. Uh, the best ones, of course, are the most vigorous. So the like of the uh, just Galanthus nivalis, Galanthus alwesii, placatus, but any of them at all. If they're growing well in your garden, you already know that it's a good plant. So what we tend to do is the ones that are growing in the garden, we'll dig them up and we'll put them in the lawn because we know they do well. Um, and if they're weaker, we don't tend to move them into the lawn because we know they need a bit more mollycoddling. So yeah, whatever grows well in your garden, I would go for rather than try and get ones that you're not sure about. You have to make sure they grow in your own garden before you can try them in the lawn because the lawn is a bit more challenging for most of them. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Look for the vigorous ones. Uh, yeah. Joe Burns is saying superb talk, Paul. Thank you very much. And uh, Chantal is also saying thank you, Paul. It was wonderful, as is Mary Coffey and Yvonne. I'm going down to see any, any questions here. Fabulous photos, inspiring talk. Thank you, Paul. Regarding the tulips planted in the lawn, do you dig them up each year? Nope, absolutely not. Um, life's too short to go digging up your tulips all the time. Um, what we do is pick the, again, try if you've got a few that are growing, uh, try to get the species varieties. So uh, there's a few particularly good species. I mentioned the peppermint stick. Um, there's a couple of them that do very well here. And we just leave them in the ground. And unfortunately, we planted a few hundred this year. The mice and the voles and all of those things will go for a percentage of them. But once they get established, they tend to be quite good and they tend to uh, persist in the ground. But absolutely not. We do not dig up our tulips. We don't even dig up the normal tulips. Uh, once the plant is in the ground here, we don't go digging it up again uh, because we just don't have the time. Uh, I'm only here three days a week. Uh, Judith helps me out here one day a week and we've got our volunteers uh, that were here today. But we just wouldn't have the resources to do that. And I wouldn't see the point in it anyhow, to be honest. So, no. Good, great. Um, Kathleen O'Donnell, thanks for the informative talk. Would you plant a single snowdrop bulb in a pot or in the ground in year one? Just received some from Esker Daffs. A uh, single snowdrop. I, I often put them in a pot for the first year, but that's because even though we've got a garden that's, uh, you know, four acres of garden and 20 acres of land, still can't find space for them ever because that's <laughs> the old problem of any gardener. Uh, there's never enough room, no matter how much space you have. But uh, if you have the space in your garden ready to go, I would actually say put it into the ground directly. Uh, but there's no problem growing in a pot. And often, sometimes it's better to grow things in a pot. And we'll do that here a lot. We'll grow it in a pot and see what it's like, see if it does well, see if it's going to be a problem plant or whatever, and then plant it out. So yeah, I would say grow it in the ground to start uh, or grow it in a pot to start and then plant it. But there's no problem doing either. Great. And it's saying thank you for all that information and so well and eloquently delivered. I think a lot of us would echo that. Fabulous talk, brilliant talk, really enjoyable and wonderful photographs. Um, great, Paul. Thank, can't wait to see them at the Snowdrop Weekend soon. Um, fantastic photos, really enjoyable talk. Paul's enthusiasm just oozes off the screen. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. This is this is great. I'm not a bit surprised. Uh, there's a lot more in that, reflecting your enthusiasm and your knowledge and uh, and an excellent delivery. Aurora is there. I don't know how you do it. So simple, smooth, informative, and beautiful pictures. Claire McNally, really enjoyable talk. Lovely mix of information and practical experience. Can't wait to see the hard work in the garden. And I must point out that for those of you who were down for snowdrops last year. When you come to look, if if and when, and I hope you will come and look at snowdrops this year, you'll be impressed with the amount of work that has gone on in the garden. There's so many areas that are being renovated. Not necessarily with the snowdrops, because we haven't got that far yet, but there's that's lots true. of other things happening. That's but true. But <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot of, of snowdrops moving, but yeah, yeah. There's uh, lots of areas of the garden that are changing. Um, how do I ensure yearly flowering of daffs in pots? I'm not keen on foliage in the ground, but the second year in a pot results in no flowers. Uh, again, use a good mix of soil, like I showed you. Um, maybe add a bit of feed. Liquid feed is no harm when bulbs are actively growing. So anytime from when they start poking their heads out now until they finish flowering. Um, maybe don't put as many in the pot if you wanted to flower. I also um make sure you get decent quality bulbs um and i know that might seem obvious but 
Uh, when you go to the German discount supermarkets, I'm not going to mention any names, uh, you can often get bulbs in there that are awfully cheap. But the reason they're awfully cheap is because they're generally the poorer grade, the smaller size. And when you're buying bulbs, um, I know from buying them off the suppliers in Holland, uh, you can often buy the smaller or the bigger one of them. And the bigger the bulb, the more likely it is to flower. And that implies no matter to any of them. So get bigger bulbs, uh, give them a good mix, give them a feed. Uh, and the other thing, as I've said before, is neglect them. So once they finish flowering, shove them into the back of the garage or shove them into the side of the shed where they don't get a whole lot of water or under the eaves of your house, around the back where nobody cares, and just leave them there and forget about them until next October or November. And that's exactly what we've done here. I've done it for the last couple of years. I've said that about the Mary Poppins one. And it seems to come back fine. You know, they, what they love is a dryness in the summer. And that's what you do when you neglect the pot in the summertime of bulbs. They could dry up nearly fully. And that's exactly how they... Uh, would grow if they're growing in the wild um, and if they're growing in fields in Holland and Belgium. Uh, we have very damp, dreary summers here in these countries, so uh, you're better to try replicate that. So, yep, that's what I would do. Excellent. Mimi has a great question. What are you most excited about for the coming season at Belfield, Paul? Ooh. Ooh. Um. <laughs> While you're thinking about that, then, could you yeah. clarify the issue of dry bulbs, please? Uh, dry snowdrops. I don't mean dry bulbs in generally. So I'm only saying that in relation to snowdrops. Dried bulbs generally are fantastic. Dried daffodils, we've been doing it for hundreds of years. It works beautifully. Uh, you can dry out every single species of bulb pretty much with the exception of snowdrops. Uh, when you buy a hundred snowdrops that are in a dried packet, um, if you get them early in the season, you might get half of them to grow. Um, if you get them later in the season when they've been in a centrally heated shop and they've been in a container moving from the Netherlands over to Ireland, over to wherever, uh, they'll have already desiccated out, they'll have taken all the moisture, they're in an open bag, uh, they hate drying out basically uh, and drying out to that extent. Obviously in the ground in the summertime they're fine, but because they're earlier, they're probably into active growth much earlier than the daffodils so they're probably should be growing rather than moving around and dried containers at that time of the year so it's only snowdrops and that's why i would say buy your snowdrops what we call in the green which is like that clump i showed you that we dug up and split out uh, it's far better to do that than anything else so don't buy dried snowdrops but dried every other bulb absolutely fine last question trish farrell what time of year would you repot daffs or snowdrops um well, whenever, I guess the best time would be autumn, uh, if they're in pots, at least you know. Uh, although if they're in the ground and you want to move them up, the best time to do them is when they're in active growth. So anytime there's foliage on them, uh, the best time, though, I suppose, would be autumn if they're in pots. Uh, take them out, divide them out, and you'll get all the little offshoots of the bulbs, too. So you can do whatever you want with them. You can bin them or you can add them to the pot. Uh, yeah, that's probably the best thing to do uh, with them. And yeah, autumn, anytime from autumn on, when they start to grow. Uh, we, I tend to, instead of repotting, I try not to need to repot here. I tend to top dress some of the bulb pots if they're in here for year two and year three, because you get weeds on the top over the summer, naturally would blow in. Uh, so I'll redress the top layer of it. I did that here and I still have to do a few bulb uh, pots to be perfectly honest. So I'm still in the process of repotting them, you could say. Um, and what my favorite thing about here for next year, uh, I suppose it changes. Um, I'm looking forward to, we've put a new woodland path through the north border, so I'm looking forward to getting that fully planted up. Looking forward to getting more plants in the ground and opening up new areas and spreading out all those snowdrops. But I think uh, the whole, we've done a no dig uh, veg garden, which uh, I never thought I'd be so excited by, but it's totally transformed one third of the wall garden for anyone who's uh, been here the last year. It'll be really different because we've done a huge amount of work. We were dragging stuff down to a bonfire yesterday. Um, it took a whole day really in the cold, frosty weather. Uh, we're trying to do work that is suitable in this cold weather at the moment. Uh, so yeah, you're gonna see big changes in the wall garden. I'm kind of excited to see what people think of what we've done and hopefully, hopefully they'll approve. <laughs> Paul, you're great. Could I just say uh, a couple of things and then perhaps I might ask Hester to say something if you wouldn't mind, Hester. I just, uh, I have a re-quote. I want to just say, you know, when I listen to you talking about Belfield, I just paraphrase that lovely phrase about plants and say, right man, right place. You, you, you sit well with Belfield. You have lineage with Angela and uh, it's, I, it's a moment when we have 190 people there, most of whom are members to say on behalf of the society, 
how pleased we are that you're in Belfield. Uh, we love having you there and we'll be visiting you in our droves in two weeks time. Uh, it's a pleasure for some of us, especially as Rennie has pointed out, to work with you as volunteers. Uh, so thank you very much for giving your time. Um, I can't wait. But if anyone drives on the snowdrops in the driveway, I'll shoot you. The war, yes. <laughs> yeah. There's a, a blunderbuss waiting at the end of the driveway. Yeah, <laughs> drive yeah uh, just to make that clear. No, it's brilliant. And and it's great to see Belfield come into life again. Hester, would you like to have the final word, please? OK, all right. Well, thank you, Paul. From one galantophile to another, um, something we might hear on Dancing with the Stars, for those of you are, that for, are familiar with that TV series, um, we were dancing with snowdrops tonight, and that was just galant gorgeous. <laughs> Paul, you have taught us so much about the snowdrop, from the different species, easy to grow cultivars, and of course, some very select forms, great encouragement given to people who are beginners and just looking forward to a new life with snowdrops and plenty of caviar in there also for the connoisseurs. We had a whirlwind tour of spring bulbs from Cyclamen Coombe to Narcissus bulbicodiums, which I'm afraid I fail with. I just get plenty of leaves, no flower, no matter what I do. Uh, it was wonderful to see Narcissus Cedric Morris, which I've had for many years, but I agree totally, it's iffy and can dwindle very easily. Most of all, it was a fabulous pleasure to visit Belfield. And this talk took us to bulbs en masse and how wonderful it is to see them in their naturalized situations. On this cold, and really it is cold today, we were minus five this morning, and we're still in the grip of winter. You have brought spring into our homes tonight and given us all plenty of enthusiasm for the months ahead. Thank you so much. Here, here. Thank you, Paul. So with that, I'll say let's go. It's uh, time time to quit. And we'll see you in a fortnight for Brona Door on growing vegetables. I hope we'll see many of you either in Ballon in Carlo, that's Ballon near Altamont. And we'll see loads and loads of you in uh, Belfield between the 8th and the 11th. Um, with a warm welcome and a cup of coffee. Uh, it would be lovely to see loads of you. So come on down and we look forward to some spring gardening. So that's enough. Thank you very much indeed. See you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good Thank night. you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.